Uh, the cultural aspect of how we are raised really does have an impact of how we view leadership. And I'm so very honored and privileged to share him with you all here today. Because here in Hong Kong, those challenges are magnified tenfold in an international based uh, workforce that we have internationally and Western trained workers with degrees working alongside uh, talented individuals who uh, are local and based here. And quite often, I'm sure you all probably have personal experience, tensions arise. So uh, Ron Brown is here to discuss what those cultural challenges may be, help open your eyes a little bit. But uh, I won't uh, have to say any more other than Dr. Ron Brown has worked with Fortune 100 companies in America. He's helped them, and he's here to help you. Dr. Ron Brown. Thank you, uh, Angie. Uh, I'm really excited and honored and pleased to be here. A little bit about me. I'm, I'm a psychologist by training, um, a management consultant by profession. I have uh, been very fortunate to work with some of America's greatest companies in the Fortune 100. Um, my sort of top line role is to help with strategy and helping organizations with diversity and inclusion and organizational transformation. However, throughout my career, I have spent uh, sort of a second track of looking at leadership development and looking at the issue of cultural differences and leadership development. And over time, I have now probably worked with probably 95,000 people in which I've taught power and leadership and influence uh, workshops through across America's corporations. So I want to just share with you some of the um, essentially some of the concepts and some of the challenges that as we look at more building uh, workforces across global uh, regions and lines, uh, some of the challenges that may be faced. So first I want to just talk about the role of differences in uh, leadership development and just uh, get clear on the concept that I pursue uh, in looking at building leadership skills. Secondly, some of the unique challenges, we'll look at some of the challenges that I typically work with uh, on a regular basis. I've been teaching these 95,000 people certain skills that begin to open the door to being a broader leader, leaders, uh, broad, to have broader leadership skills. And then it, talk about some implications for a, a diverse workforce. So first, uh, it is sort of standard philosophy, certainly in U.S. firms, that uh, when, when uh, providing leadership training or development, that one size fits all. We want to take people through a particular uh, leadership experience. Uh, everybody goes in, uh, everybody comes out, and what happens is that some people go in and they look like the bright stars. They kind of get it. And they kind of feel like, you know, this was just the perfect course for them. Uh, other people come out and they kind of get it, but they, it just didn't click fully, but somewhat they got it. And then there are other people who say, you know, I didn't quite get it. It was, you know, it was un I understood it. It was certainly something that intellectually understood, but it just doesn't translate to me. So essentially, we, we're, we're seeing sort of these different uh, levels of comprehension, different levels of adapting leadership knowledge and skills. So if you take the one-size-fits-all model, you would say, well, then that's a natural outcome. You're going to get some people who get it, a lot of people in the middle who kind of kind of get it, and then some people who don't get it. So that seems like the natural outcome. We provided the best that they could know. Some people um, just didn't get it. So I take what I call the agricultural model. 
is that as you develop leaders, you want to look at maybe developing people in different plots of land with different exposure. You want to have a more focused and unique leadership development. You want to take into account differences, cultural differences, ethnic differences. You want to take those factors in account. So perhaps we need different kinds of training programs. And many of the companies I've worked with uh, in the U.S. have really supported this, and we've seen some great outcomes based on providing unique cultural and gender uh, type uh, leadership development programs. So that's what we do. That's the unique uh, value added we bring is we're talking power and leadership and influence, but we're also exploring the cultural and gender differences. Um, so a belief that we have that the issues that may be experienced as you, you know, look across different lines, like the U.S. mindset, and then you get out here and you talk to people uh, from Asia, different parts of Asia, uh, the issues aren't intellectual. There, there's plenty of brain power. Uh, so as people sort of not track with each other, the issues are not intellectual. The issues are not about effort. I, I think people work hard. They intend to work hard. They intend to, to achieve uh, whatever the organization's purpose is. For me, the issue is about cultural challenges. And that starts with first having different value sets having different values that people hold about some of the same things. So when I tell you I'm teaching 95,000 people, I'm teaching a core curriculum, but as I teach in different cultures, there are totally different responses to the same leadership material. So if I teach groups of Asians, I get a, a response. If I teach groups of African Americans, I get a very different response. If I teach Latin Americans, I get a very different response. So yet we are using the same core content, and it really illuminates the fact that there are cultural differences do matter, and it's part of the reason that people have to examine leadership through a cultural lens. So the first part of that is understanding what are my values. So there are issues of organizational life that you have to have some place where you can examine w your values about that environment, your values about work. Uh, so some people assume we all have the same values, but maybe we don't have the same values about work or success. So it starts with values. The second is mindset. What is the mindset you take into the workplace? And so I ask people just to uh, talk about their mindsets. Well, some of that is, well, People have work mindsets. They got to go do the work. They got lists that generated, and they do work uh, things. But there are other dynamics going on inside the organization. For instance, there are political dynamics going on inside the organization. So, what is your mindset about these different dynamics beyond work? The what I call the intangibles. The tangibles are clear: do X, do Y, get Z result. But the intangibles are where the confusion and the uh, issues lie within exploring the intangibles. Then I like to ask people, what is your emotion about work? What do you really feel? How do you feel about the environment you're in and the work you're doing and some of the concepts of leadership? You will not be a great leader unless you really feel comfortable, if you feel like you're, you can do this and it, uh, it can be challenging, but you feel good about it. If you feel that you're in something that's uneasy, then you won't want to do it very well and you won't learn as much. So understanding what your emotions are. And then finally, what's your orientation? And so many people come into the organization and they have what I call a survival orientation. And their view is, you know, I've got a good job, I want to do well, I'm just going to hang in here, and I hope that people recognize what I'm doing and the work I'm doing, and maybe I will be advanced or get promoted. And, and survival orientation is like, 
I'm putting it in somebody else's hands, and I just hope that good things will happen. Uh, and we're asking people to explore more of a mastery orientation, which says, I can make good things happen. I can do things in my career. I can take charge in a way that I can make things happen. And so I think I, I consider survival as more a bottom-up orientation to the organization. And some people, by culture, are susceptible to a bottom-up orientation. And where, on the other hand, mastery is a top-down orientation. Uh, and so you begin to think top-down. How can I get this done? What's it going to take? Uh, many of you as journalists, I mean, you know, you've, to get to a source, you think top-down. How can I get there? How can I get access? How can I get to this person? You know, how am I going to really do this? Uh, you don't think, you know about how difficult it's going to be. You may think how difficult, but your intention is to uh, go beyond those difficulties and get that interview, get that source. So these are some of the themes, and we ask people to examine leadership in the context of values, in the context of mindset, in the context of their emotion, and in their orientation, survival, or mastery. So I've identified, and that started out very early on, six cultural challenges that tend to be the most difficult cultural challenges for different groups of people. And that's where the different responses come out. That these are six challenges that people have emotional value conflicts about that need to be explored. So any teaching of leadership power, leadership influence, um, needs to explore these types of challenges. So I help people look at power, politics, loyalty, aggressiveness, socialization, and subordination. And in these challenges, I find with different cultures, there are latent issues. There are just issues that people grew up with. I always ask people, you know, what did your parents say about this? And what were the unspoken messages about it? So going back, trying to plumb your values, what was, what was kind of the message to you about these particular things? So let me pick one that we always start with is power. We are asking people to understand the power dynamics in any organization. Understand who has power, how they use power, you know, how power functions as a competitive dynamic in any organization. Who has influence? What does it take to influence the system? Do you fully understand the nature of that influence? So we have to explore that constantly within a cultural framework. So it's one thing to say one should influence the organization but based on background and cultural understanding, that may be a challenging task. So for instance, uh, one of the things, see, I've just, these are some expressions that I hear, and I just picked Asian because we're here in Hong Kong, but I, when I talk about power in Asian context, uh, what you hear is, well, uh, the group is powerful. I guess in the group meaning the organization is powerful, and that there's an issue that only those who are worthy of power, or only those who have earned it should seek it or use it. And so there's a, there's a sense that you have to, over time, earn power. Well, that's not the reality. There are people who very early are able to build power and influence, who understand the concept, uh, who don't necessarily earn it, but they learn the skills and they can do it. And, and power is beyond a hierarchical respect. And that's very much, well, I, I want to do things, but I have to respect the hierarchy. And the hierarchy is saying, well, we want you to do X. And it's like, well, I can't do that until they tell me to do X. And so there's some conflict there about, you know, the mobility of power, the mobility of influence, and how to move around the hierarchy in doing that. Uh, I noticed that many women, uh, oh, there's an emphasis on power sharing, but one of the challenges for women is the view that power has kind of a male, uh, uh, it's embodied in male, in a male phenomenon. 
and how do women uh, build their own styles, be, get comfortable in their own styles, and use their own style of power. Um, I have been working with some of Cheryl Stanford's uh, uh, lean-in groups. And one of the things I find is that women certainly want to lean in, but to lean in into a scrum for power, that's not quite what they signed up for. Because there are, there's competition for power going on all the time inside organization. There are tremendous numbers of daily power transactions. So leaning in would mean you would be getting into that daily scrum. And a lot of women say, well, you know, I might want to lean into that, but I don't know if I have the skills. And that looks like a pretty rough game. So uh, let me think about it. And so women may back off in terms of getting into and learning the skills of power as a part of their leadership. Um, let me pick another one of the cultural challenges, politics. And when I ask people, these are some Asian expressions of different groups I've, over the years, probably the last 20 years, I've uh, worked with a lot of Asian leaders across the U.S and some who are based here. Uh, and what you hear, some expressions, is that politics are unimportant. I don't want to get involved in the politics. I'd rather be judged by my objective results. So look at my work and value me based on my work. Uh, politics is sort of a necessary evil uh, and that you want to get your work done. It's a distraction from getting good work done. And so there's a reliance on this value that I want to be rewarded based on my merit and my work. I don't want to get engaged in the subjectivity of politics. Uh, yet, uh, the reality is to be a good leader, you have to be able to master the politics in any organization. You have to be able to connect the dots and see where the political tripwires are, who's doing what. I mean, there's, there's a level of energy to master the realities of politics in any organization. So helping people examine this, their values about this so that they can engage the politics, so they can, uh, rather than avoid politics, engage politics and see the politics and connect the dots. That's a challenge because these are, are cultural expressions, but they're also screens from learning how to be effective in certain organizational experiences. So these are screens. So for many women say, well, I want to get involved in the politics, but uh, there's a high value on good, harmonious relationships. And politics means we're going to get into some disruptive relationships in the organization. So there may be some people that I get along with now that down the line I will not be getting along with, and that feels uncomfortable. And so there's a reluctance to engage. So in order to help people master politics, we have to at least explore those feelings, values, uh, mindsets about politics so, so that people can clear that. And we're not asking people to change their values. I'm asking people to stretch their values. I'm asking them to stretch far enough to try to be effective in a different way. For some people, this is life changing. It's like I never thought about it that way. And how can I now seeing this and seeing it in the context of my own values, can I stretch my values to be more effective? Finally, just something that we focus on is the issue of socialization. And uh, I view that as the accumulation of relationships. And uh, I'm not a big networking fan in the sense of traditional networking. I believe in part of the skill is accumulating relationships that are going to be actionable relationships. Relationships where you call and people call you back. Or you call and there's enough of a relationship that you can exchange the data that you need and people kind of know you. There's a level of trust. You've built those relationships. And so there's an intention not just to sort of, hey, let's do lunch next week, you know, here's my card, but much more of some binding and bonding in order that those relationships become actionable. So when I look at some of the Asian expressions I've seen over the years, it would be that 
socialization and going intentionally going after relationships and building them feels uncomfortable. So uh, people are more likely to be reactive rather than proactive. That proactive means you really are going to go after people. You're going to accumulate with intention, and that feels uncomfortable. I, I'm just a nice person. I get along with everybody. I don't like the fact that I would be uh, acting in social settings with some intention. And so, so there's a sense of backing away and essentially setting up some social distance. Uh, I find many people say, well, no, I don't want to go to that reception tonight. Uh, I've got to go home and be with my family. And they consistently do it because there's a discomfort in being in these social settings and taking advantage of these social settings that then they back away altogether. So until we examine that in the context of what your leadership goals are and what your objectives are, you know, how do we examine that and see if there's a way that you can, you can master the social uh, accumulation of relationships across your company and beyond? Uh, I think uh, women um, have an advantage because the relationships, you know, are primary and what these are expressions I hear so having good relationships are primary and I think this particular focus is an advantage for people who uh, who are good at relationship building but there's still the question is what's the intention so are we just building friends are we building and so a lot of you as journalists you know you build these relationships with reliable sources and so what I hear from many people is well, I can do that as a journalist when I want to get a reliable source. I have difficulty doing it for myself. I can't do it in, 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 on behalf of my own career and my own interests. It's hard for me. It's too selfish to think that way. But I could do some of these things in order to get to a source or get an interview. So um, again, these are issues. Um, some look very simple, like loyalty. But just coming off of a session uh, on Sunday with uh, 30 people, mostly Asian, this was a very difficult cultural issue to explore. Uh, and so my view is once we open up uh, an understanding of culture and how they affect these particular issues, then people then learn about leadership in a very different way. They are not refraining from engaging they they are going to, then they're able to take any leadership course any generic leadership course and learn uh, a lot more but it is these sort of invisible cultural challenges that are the barriers to people giving more energy learning more i've just you know in my 95,000 people i've seen ceos evolve i don't take full credit but uh, they give me credit, so I, I'll take that. I've seen CEOs involved. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, when I, Procter & Gamble was my first client, and I worked about over 22 years as a consultant at Procter & Gamble. Part of the time I was there, Stephen Covey came in, and that's where we began, he and I and several other consultants we were going to talk, but he had in his mind about the seven habits. And so, uh, if I could go seven habits of power, I, I'd have a different profile today, but he's done very well, and uh, uh, he's no longer with us, but he's done, he, he did something that changed the way that people think uh, in organization. So uh, what I see now is that the need for people to really look at building their power and influence skills and understanding it sharply from a cultural perspective. Same way with political savvy, that is very much a dynamic that's needed. Most people are working hard to un understand the unwritten rules of the game. And I say it's like people are working and looking at things in their organization through a sheet of gauze. They can kind of see things going on, or they can see them very directly, but they may not really understand what's going on and why. And so it's my job to provide that. Uh, most people would say 
it's not likely that they're going to walk around and have some senior person invite them to lunch in the corporate cafeteria and say, let's sit and talk about how you're going to get some more power and influence. They're not likely to get that kind of coaching, uh, that kind of mentoring, um, and that's where my work comes in, and I've been pleased to do it for so many years. So I thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about this. To me, this is a very vital and exciting work. Uh, uh, the results, uh, we were just talking with uh, Melody about how do I measure results? We, you know, are there some uh, analytics? Analytics are creeping in everywhere. Uh, I look at a lot of analytics, but as, as I look at the, the success of people moving two to three le levels up, uh, I've seen more reporters uh, who uh, I can count on a couple of hands for sure. People I met who were reporters, they were first beat reporters, and now are an executive editors or above. So I know that there's something catalytic, I like to call it, while I'm giving these lessons, I just see the lights go on. I see people say, oh, that's what that's all about, and uh, the lights go on. So uh, this is what I do, and I'm just glad to be in here. I've got uh, Angie has uh, introduced me into various settings. I spoke before the Women's Foundation last week, and uh, there's just more of this, and so this is a great opportunity to share this with you. So I. Look forward to any of your questions. I mean, this is this is where we really get into it. But um, thank you very much for having me here. I feel like we were talking all around it, but we never addressed the elephant in the room. We never addressed the word power. Power. What does it mean? Why, should, why are so many people afraid of it? And why are some leaders better at wearing power than others who are intimidated by it? To me, the creative tension that drives organization is the pursuit of power. They want to be the number one this, the number one that, the dominant player in their industry. They want their, their issues of power. We want to be the preferred employer. We want to be the uh, dominant theme. And so within that is a pursuit of power and it generates uh, the competition for power. And the competition for power generates the politics. So you must understand the critical role that power plays and get comfortable. Now, once uh, normally I start talking about power for by 40 45 minutes in some of the sessions I run, I just keep talking about power because I want people's values about power to bubble up. And most of the time, people are getting uncomfortable. And uh, at GE uh, one time, I had an engineer just get up and said, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to go home. Uh, I think you're taking us down some dark, dark hole, and I don't want to go there. The feelings of power are generally negative. People are uncomfortable talking through power. There's a, a nervous energy. And power is a hidden language. And so my goal is to just put that on the table, help people explore their cultural and personal reactions to power. Um, my belief to be is to be a good leader, you have to be comfortable with power. Now, there are people who can lead. They lead teams. They do a number of things. But if you are intending to rise and contribute to an organization, part of your leadership is being comfortable with the nature of power, being comfortable using it, getting it, keeping it, working with people who have power. So it's kind of like um, it is the key, uh, it's the name of the game in any organization. And so I find people who are smart, who have skills, uh, but it's like they're running on to a football pitch with a basketball in their hands. They're just playing the wrong game. And I find many people are in that state because they don't understand. At a certain level, it is beyond competence. Your competence is already established. 
Now it's about how you understand the power dynamics in the organization. Uh, regardless of what sector, and, and I think it's ju not just women, but men as well. Um, you know, I'm curious about oh, how, right. how we figure out what the rules of the game are. Well, uh, I, it's interesting, you know, I, my career started teaching power to African Americans, and then it's expanded to other groups and expanded to women, and then I wound up at Exxon Mobil teaching power to the white male leadership at, at Exxon Mobil. But one of the things I asked, you know, are you guys powerful? And they, and they didn't, there was not a beat in the room. They said, yeah. So I said, well, where did you learn power? And there was silence. They couldn't, uh, and then finally one guy said, well, you know, I, w I used to be the executive assistant to Mr. So-and-so, and I think I sort of imitated his style and maybe I wouldn't have called it power, but maybe it rubbed off on me. But I think there in for men there is a culture of power that isn't explained, but that you can sort of osmotically get into and roll with and there's a language. And yet nobody's using the word power. But the intent is there. The skills are there, they're just implied. And so if you're outside of that culture, it's hard to hear it. Like, I tell people that the word influence is a much more positive tone than power. Nobody is walking around corporate America for sure saying, yeah, let's get some more power. <laughs> it's like, well, influence the organization. Well, I think the major players who are men, when they hear the word influence, they fully understand intuitively it's about power. I think people who are not in the core, we hear that word and something else takes over. We hear, okay, uh, I'll go influence the organization, whatever that means. And so, but we're not on the beam. I, I use the example, it's like somebody has taught us to take the local train. And we, every day, we take the local train and we bounce along every stop. And nobody has ever told us there's an express train over there, how you get tickets. And that's what you're asking. Well, wait, well, is there, there's an express train that could get me there faster? Well, how do you get tickets and what do you need to do and what's it cost? Nobody is available to tell you that. So if you're fortunate, somebody, probably male, would take you under the wing and over time, you would get better. But my view is the more consciously you understand this, the faster you can go and the better you can get. And there's no no course that I know of other than my own of mentoring. But even with mentoring, uh, if you were being mentored and you said to your mentor, well, teach me more about power, your mentor may say, well, you know, I." I I don't know, except I feel powerful, but I don't know how to break it out and teach you about power. Uh, and so that's what my work does. It sort of gives people the framework to understand the nature of power. I mean, that's what you're saying. Is it about figuring out who can show you where to buy the ticket for the express train? Yes. That seems to be part of your answer. Yes. What other advice would you give to people? Uh, you've got to get over like I ask people like a first question uh, as they as I coach them and I say what is your power objective why would you want to take the train in the first place where are you going you just well I you know I just want to get over there because it's a faster train no what you have to be heading somewhere and so it starts with defining a power objective uh, and or I'll ask something like how much power do you want and somebody says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Well, these are the kinds of things you have to at least get comfortable with power so you can answer the question, yeah, there's a power objective I have or several power objectives, and I can sort of get comfortable with how much power I want. So it's, a, it's, a, the, it's the first thing is being able to accept that 
power is the core reality. And then, uh, see, I, I believe every day people are walking across an active, live power grid. And most of them have the mindset towards work and never think about the active, live power grid. And so if you aren't thinking about your power objective, you're sort of going to work, you're getting things done, things are happening to you, things are going on all around you, but your mind isn't focused on the power dynamics. So it starts first with getting grounded. You can, you can walk across that grid every day and do your job and you will be the backbone of our organization and somebody we respect for what you do. But if you intend to influence that organization or move to greater platforms of influence, then you have to consider the choice to compete for power. So that means get grounded. Yes, there's a hand over there. Getting power or coming into a, a position of power um, that maybe you need to compromise your values or maybe at times you need to do things that you're not completely comfortable with. And I don't mean in, you know, stepping outside your comfort zone and taking on a challenging position, but maybe sometimes these games we talk about that they may not always be, um, what would I say, you know, that people do things that are not always so nice. Right. And I think that that's where I feel that, you know, maybe some people become uncomfortable with, well, what does it really take to get there? Or right. what does it really mean? And right. I'd love just to hear your thoughts around right. that. Right, right. Well, it, it's interesting. So the first thing you hear is people conjure up the most negative image they can think of. Well, I don't want to be a so-and-so. Uh, you know, I even heard the latest uh, U.S. presidential candidate brought up last night. I don't want to be like him. Well, yeah, well, and what the part of it is that there are a whole lot of average everyday people who have power, who aren't on the extreme. Uh, you don't have to model an extreme. There's so many people who have power that you're just somebody in the middle. You, there's a way to have it. So first is just taking away the most neg negative imagery of that. Um, and then people go further into their assumptions about what it takes to get it, and they don't realize that power is very neutral. And there's some people who are awful with power. There are some people who have, uh, have the instinct for power, but they're bad instincts. I mean, the good or bad of it, that's for you to judge. But that what, what has to happen is to get power into neutral and away from the negative, and that is just neutral. Anybody can have it. Anybody can learn the architecture of using it, getting it, and then put their own personal style on it. So you don't have to become somebody or change who you are. I mean, uh, I like people who can be themselves. They can smile and relax, but in their mind, they understand the use of power, how to get it, how to do it, and they're comfortable with that because that's the game. And uh, so it's working through getting to neutral that this is just basic. Um, I, I, some of the skills of power every parent uses. And so they're just the skills of power every parent uses. So put that in the workplace take the charge off of it because there is a charge so I, I say that power players are such that those who know about power don't tell and those who don't know don't need to know there's no need to encourage more players onto the field so if you if you will do the work and be happy but a little frustrated keep working we don't need more players, skilled players on the field, because that increases the competition for power. So nobody sort of, nobody sort of maybe keeping you out, but they certainly aren't encouraging you in. Why would they, you know, as I tell people, well, we want a level playing field. I said, there's never a level playing field. 
The field is always tilted to those that power. That's part of the power skills is to tilt the, tilt the field to your advantage. That's just a natural power skill. So it will probably never be level. You know, if there, I'm having some uh, discussions with millennials about the meritocracy. And their feeling is, yes, there is a meritocracy, right? I said, no, I don't think so. Because <laughs> once you understand the dynamic of power, there, there can be a meritocracy. Some people are more skilled at power than others. The other thing I want to say is that some people are just in the power dynamics with instincts. Some have good instincts. Some have instincts but poor skills. And so when we see people with poor skills, we say, no, I don't want to be like that. And therefore, people back up and don't want to get engaged because they see bad instinctual behavior or poor skills, and no one's ever sort of laid out what's the standard of the skill that you need. Like subordination is a skill. Everybody, if you're going to be a leader, you've got to know when to pucker up and to whom, and do it well, and because doing it poorly, somebody will accuse you of any number of things. So, but it is a skill, and those people, executives that I know, uh, when, when the board, I mean, I've seen CEOs, when they have the board meetings, those subordination skills just click in. They're helping this board member, they're helping this, you know, or if there's some money that they're seeking and they need funding, those subordinate here, let me get that for you. Now, do you need this? Can I get can I get your drink? All of it clicks in and to do it in a way that looks natural and not clumsy. That's part of the skill. So what I hear is that once we get into subordination, people are like, I don't want to do that. You know, and I'm a woman and I don't want to be seen getting it. But if your intention is to get more power, perhaps one of the best ways you can do it is say, can I get you a cup of coffee and then sit down. <laughs> and do that so that you feel healthy and you're not being stereotyped as a woman, but you, because you have a clear power objective in doing it. Yes, there's a question down there. Um, do you think then that the louder and noisier you are, the more likely it is you're going to get power? And if you're in a position of power, do you think you notice the people who are louder and noisier? Um, and I ask this because I watched an interesting talk on YouTube by Susan Kane on the power of introverts. Um, and how it's, it's really very difficult for introverts to, to get on in an organization because they're simply not noticed. Right. Well, right. well uh, I don't think that um, you need to be loud or whatever. I think you need to be yourself. I think, I, the, to me, power is an intellectual understanding that over time you also feel and you exude, you exude a confidence in it. And so being louder, you know, being, that's not the skill. The skill isn't a physical, frontal directness. The skill is in your mind how there are several skills to use power and getting comfortable and practicing those skills and just till they become automatic, then you can be as introverted as is possible. Sometimes your organization doesn't allow that. But I'm not for taking people too far out of their natural skills. How do you understand the skills of power and then wrap your personality around it? And that takes practice, 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 to where what you now know looks natural. So I'm just talking to a senior journalist out here, and she was just saying, you know, I don't think about it anymore. And, and I know I've changed, and people know that I've changed, but I don't even think about it. So as we were going back through the base, she says, wow, I've just, I now have just incorporated this into my own style. So I don't think you, uh, there are people, and more instinctive people, who use loudness, uh, but that is just one 
expression of power. Most of the people who have power are just very calm, collected, have a top-down mentality of, I don't have to yell, I can get most things done. I can be quiet, and uh, as long as I know how to pull the levers of power, it doesn't matter. I, I don't care if you misperceive me. I have the skills and I have the mindset. Uh, and so I, that's part of what there is to learn. You, you must have coached a lot of leaders, right? Yeah. And um, in your experience, what's the biggest obstacle or, or impediment for people to really make change? Because most people have gone through to talk or listen, but but actually not many people actually make the, the, the quantum leap or, 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 or change. And um, how, how do you make them really make the change? You want to rise up. And now I can look at several CEOs that I can look back when we were having the first conversations. But that means you've got to sail your boat into the sea of very powerful people. So first you've got to be comfortable with your own power objectives and that you want to be in that company. So like one of the people I know uh, has gone beyond being a CEO in the U.S. and now is on the major committee at Davos, some a major committee at Davos. So now he's in another sea of powerful people uh, because he's learned to sail out in that kind of sea, if I can use that analogy. So part of it is getting grounded, understanding that this is the game and these are the skills of that game and that you, you've chosen now to go play with people many of whom have better skills than you. And then you've chosen to learn from them. So if you have kind of the basic playbook, then you can learn from other power players. So uh, one CEO, uh, before he became CEO, he was on the board of a major company and he was able to watch some real players play. And it helped him, and as he brought that back to his own organization, it helped him to be a better CEO when he finally moved to CEO. But this is a, um, you have to be a student of the game. It's not every now and then you turn on your power light. It's like it becomes a part of your mindset, and you're just a student of the game of power. It would be hard for you to sit at even this table and not watch the power dynamics, whatever they are. Uh, you would go into very few meetings and not be watching and reading the power dynamics. It just, you're kind of uh, helping those people who really want to, you know, scale those mountains, then how to be a student of everything that's happening. And then over time, it's just automatic. First, it's stark. It's like, wow, that look what that guy just did, or look what you know, look where, how she. I, I watched a woman um, just skillfully settle in. The issue got out of hand, and I watched her skillfully take charge and then set the terms. And just, did you see that? And people were like, what she? You know, they didn't see it. She was so skilled that they didn't see it. So you have to be a student of it. And it has to be important enough. And the way you keep it important is you have a power objective. So the clearer you are about your power objective, the more you study power, the more you want it, the more you... So I, I say that in a way that people are like, oh, they cringe. You know, wanting power, galvanizing yourself, motivating yourself to go get it as a positive. Uh, Hilda? Can you give us a bit more details on the, the example you just raised where the woman did it and other people didn't really know she was doing exactly what is it? I'm still like, is it uh, a bit? Well, I, 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 I'm well, not getting well, uh, it. So let me give you the example. Um, uh, like, I've seen a leader come in and say, you know, let's uh, brainstorm about how we're going to tackle this problem. I want us to brainstorm for about an hour and a half. 
on how we're going to tackle this problem. And then after we brainstorm, I want to get some solutions on the board. But, uh, you know, by 3 o'clock, I want to take a solution out of here. And I think the solution ought to be like X, Y, and Z. Now, here is somebody skillfully using power to set the process. We're going to do brainstorming. It sounded so rational. Then we're going to use get solutions, but I want this done by 3 o'clock this afternoon. And set it in a way that only after, after it was over you thought, wow, this wasn't really a wide open thing. This is, they had something in mind. And so doing that skillfully and just setting the terms comfortably, skillfully, you know, the majority of the people there don't get a reaction. There's probably one or two like, yeah, I don't know about this. But most of the people are going along with um, I just saw, just a, it's very simple of being able to set your expectations, to establish the ground rules, to lay out the parameters we're going to work in. This is what this story should be about. These are the things we're going to cover. I mean, there's a way in which you shape that that's all part of power. Um, I saw, uh, I was working with some young techies uh, who were building an app, and a guy came in who had money, a VC, I think, uh, and he said, you know, I want this, I want that. He kept talking, and then he, this was like Wednesday, he said, and I want that by Friday, and kept talking. And he never entertained, the way he said it was, they couldn't even bring up, we can't get that done by Friday. <laughs> and which means they would be working 24-7 until Friday to even approach it. But he said it in such a powerful matter of fact, skillful way that before they knew it, they had signed up to getting it done just because the comfort with power that this guy had. And I think we've uh, run out of time. I'm so sorry because we tapped into the power grid and now we got to <laughs> dim down the lights a little bit. But um, if you check out... Uh, Dr. Brown's email um, and also his website. It, I'm sure that he would welcome um, any follow-up questions or inquiries. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think the the one thing that resonated was, you know, if in every organization it's about the competition for power, of course they're not going to tell us the rules. There aren't any rules, are there? Uh, and I think at the end of the day, no one's going to invite you. You invite yourself, um, and uh, the skill of being a good leader is to understand all of those dynamics. And thank you, Dr. Brown, for helping us understand those thank today. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. That's a tough lunch, huh? <laughs>